Hello, my name is David Reisig. I serve as associate editor of JSKY. I am the chief scientific officer and director of structural and coronary intervention, and I'm coming to you from the Honor Health Medical Center in Scottsdale, Arizona. I am honored to represent JSKY and editor in chief, Dr. Alexander Lansky. This is an exciting morning for me. We're here today to discuss a very important document published in JSKY titled First in Human Experience with a Novel Multimodality Deep OCT NEARS Intercoronary Imaging System. I am joined by a distinguished panel of leaders and experts in the field. First, Dr. Ziad Ali, the director of the Demetrius Cardiovascular Institute, director of Investigational Interventional Cardiology, and director of the Cardiorenal Program at St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center in New York. Our next panelist is someone who needs no introduction, Nobel laureate and ACC scientist of the year, Dr. James Muller. Dr. Muller comes to us from Brigham and Women's, where he is a senior lecturer at the Harvard Medical School in Boston. And finally, Dr. Tom Johnson, associate professor in cardiology at the Bristol Heart Institute in Bristol, UK. Doctors, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Dr. Ali, I'm going to turn it over to you to give us some of the highlights from this very important uh, paper. Thanks very much, Dave. And uh, thanks to James and Tom for joining. So I've got the pleasure of talking to you about the first in human experience with a novel intravascular imaging device called Deep OCT NEARS uh, Intracoronary Imaging System. So the background behind this was that there has been a real growth of intravascular imaging over the last 10 years with an increasing recognition that it actually helps PCI outcomes. A good example of this is the Renovate Complex PCI study, which was published earlier last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, followed by a series of publications, and this week actually a major meta-analysis published in The Lancet by our group. But using intravascular imaging has been metamorphosized into PCI guidance, really in the pre-procedure to strategize and the post-procedure to optimize. But there's other things that intravascular imaging can potentially do, and that's identify high risk. And when we look at the PROSPECT-2 study, along with other, others such as the LRP study and the color registry with, of course, uh, Dr. Muller's extremely well um, versed, you notice that it is possible to identify patients and lesions that are high risk based on their lipid profile. And we've been trying to really adapt this into a clinically meaningful and utilized is clinically like we did in the PROSPECT-2 study. Now, one of the areas of confusion which really bothers me is this constant battle between OCT and IVUS. When should I use OCT? When should I use IVUS? And Tom, who's also on uh, this webcast, was an author, in fact, the first author of the second component of a very, very practically important document uh, in the European uh, Heart Journal. And that was the consensus document on intracoronary imaging. And what they quite elegantly pointed out, as shown as in, in this slide, that there's basically the same number of dots for IVUS and OCT. And essentially, they do the same thing, but there are some important differences. And if we just highlight them, <clears throat> like we've shown in the box, basically, OCT has incredible resolution at the cost of depth, and IVUS has pretty poor resolution at the advantage of depth. And then at the bottom, when you're looking at other areas that can help identify high-risk patients and not just strategize and optimize, you have near-infrared spectroscopy, which can identify high-risk plaque precision, really irrespective of whether it's partnered with OCT or with IVUS. To date, and again, Dr. Muller is the best person in the world to speak about this, IVUS and NEARS integration has been used. It's actually available clinically from the NEPRO system. <clears throat> and actually, the IVUS on the system is excellent, but gives you the additional benefit of the near infrared spectroscopy. But what if we could have it all, right? And the idea was 
What if you could have extreme resolution, you could have the ability to detect lipid using near-infrared spectroscopy, but you also had depth? Would you want that and would there be a benefit? And that was the background behind the SpectroWave Hyperview system. So in this system, what you can see is we have something called deep OCT, which might seem at the beginning like an oxymoron, but in fact it isn't. What you can see here is the ability to look deep into the vessel wall, but maintain this extreme resolution, integrating depth, resolution, and precision. The Hyperview system is currently now commercially available, and we did the first in human experiments in Columbia of 25 patients. Here on this slide, you can see the ability with extreme detail to evaluate morphology and composition. And guys, you'll notice that even within the calcium itself, there are features that we have not previously recognized in calcified vessels. You can see cholesterol crystals with exquisite resolution. And very importantly for determining stent sizing, you can see the external elastic lamina exquisitely well, making sizing, and as I'll mention briefly, artificial intelligence very apt to do all of this work for you. And finally, assessing post-PCI uh, uh, assessments like looking at stent structs and apposition becomes very, very easy. <clears throat> this is the first in human experience. That's me doing the first case in uh, Cali, Colombia, now uh, over a year ago. And what we did is we compared OCT to HD IVIS systems. So we took the SpectraWave system and said, okay, so we're telling everybody we've got you know, superior resolution, depth, and um, the ability to detect nears, but, but how is that better than what's already available? Why can't I just use HD IVIS? And the Abbott system is fantastic. I'm just gonna use that. So let me show you. What you're looking on the right panel is an example of a panel of different morphologies. And if we just scroll quickly through, if you look at A, look at the exquisite resolution of being able to see the external elastic lamina. In C, you can see, B, you can see the external elastic laminas visible whether or not there's neointima in front of it. On C, you can see areas of healed plaque. In D, you can see exquisite demarcation of calcification. In E, you can see a dissection with exquisite resolution. In F, you can see the back wall of calcium, which often is obscured, especially if there's lipid within calcium. In G, you're able to easily measure the areas of healed plaque, even when it's sitting on top of lipid. You'll notice in panel F, you have a heavily calcified plaque, but you see the co-localization of nears. So you could postulate that this calcium is actually creme brulee or egg-like calcium, so much easier to fracture. You'll also notice in H that what might look like on conventional OCT to be the beginnings of a calcified nodule is actually macrophages with a large burden of lipid behind it. And you can see areas, and I really like J. Look at J. You can see the details of a calcified nodule poking into the lumen that's still covered with a fibrous cap but has no thrombus on it. In K, you can see very particulate small areas of thrombus at an area of a plaque rupture. This is what we would normally expect to see with sort of micro OCT. And then finally in L, you can see the vasovasorum. But, you know, here I showed you great extreme resolution. What's the impact? What's the benefit compared to what we already have? So on the left side, you can see a direct comparison of co-registered images of Optus OCT, this is a commercially available system, against deep OCT. So I'll ask you gentlemen, do you think you can see more detail on one than the other and does it matter? I think that the co-localization of lipid, along with the presence of calcification and the ability to see the thickness of the calcification definitely impacts my decision making. And look at the ability to measure the external elastic lamina in D compared to C, which will allow me much more easily to either use AI or make manual assessments. Now, the second thing we talked about was depth, right? Now, one of the biggest issues with IVIS is that when you have calcium, you can't see the depth of the calcium. In fact, you can't see the vessel wall. But on panel E in a co-registered image, you can see the only the arc of calcium with reverberation behind it, but in F, you're actually able to see the thickness of the calcium and see how thick the vessel wall is. 
Likewise, in panel G, which is much more lipidic, we've confirmed the presence of lipid, which you can see on panel G, but in panel H, you're also able to see the thickness and the depth of the artery wall. So this is what makes deep OCT nears unique. Now, we, there's one more feature here, guys, that's near and dear to my heart, and that is, Dave mentioned to you that I was the director of the cardiorenal program at St. Francis. What if I told you you could do OCT without using contrast and just use saline? And the value here comes at the extremely rapid pullback of the deep OCT system. By making a much more rapid pullback, you can get a much better clearance of blood with saline and you'll be surprised to know that actually each of these images is in fact a saline flush. If you focus in on the lumen, you'll see a tiny bit of speckle. But I would challenge you to tell me that this is any worse or better than a contrast assessment. And so the ability to do contrast-free saline flushes affords you the opportunity to do multi-vessels without having to worry about where we normally use IVUS and importantly use this on patients with CKD, which is a big population, especially in Japan, where one in five patients actually suffers from CKD. Now, what if I told you all this, but you had this massive catheter and you know you had to drive a Zamboni into the cath lab? You know, Dave, that's not gonna fit with the Protego system. How's that gonna work? Well, this is a very low profile rapid exchange catheter that's actually thinner than some of the commercially available devices already, even the next gen devices it actually gets the whole artery with one pullback, so 10 centimeters. It's got a very short lens to tip. And the reason that's important is as we start imaging more distally into branches, distal LED, PDA, we don't end up with that dead space that doesn't allow us to image. <clears throat> we can do saline compatible pullbacks. There's absolutely no flush required, and you can do, decide to do high resolution mode or uh, a survey mode as you please. And it's just one button. Now, one thing I didn't talk about, I'm gonna end on this guys, is SpectraWave did an incredible job of integrating AI and actually just made no big deal about it. They're like, oh, hey, you want the EL? No problem. You wanna co-register it? No problem. How about the calcium? We'll highlight it in blue for you. We'll highlight the lipid in, in yellow for you. We'll identify the EL for you. We'll identify the side branches, the stent expansion and the apposition. So actually, all of the things that you need to know for MLD Max are already there. So, are you Ziad, yeah. <clears throat> this, this, this is just fascinating. But how much resolution is enough? When you're talking about being in the cath lab, the clinical relevance, is there a real advantage to this device over the competitors? Uh, so, you know, I think there's a couple of answers to that. First of all, Dave, what kind of TV you have at home? You have a black and white TV? No, you get an OLED, right? We like resolution, it's good, it's pleasing to us, number one. But number two, clinically, I think that you can now see details and features of calcium that I couldn't see before. So as I showed you in one of the earlier images, you can actually see things that are inside the calcium. And that might help us to determine how easy it is to break, for example, with shockwave. So the resolution's not only pleasing to the eye, but I think it has some clinical implication, especially the depth. Um, boy, Jim, I, I'm I'm having a a very uh, satisfactory moment, hearkening back to our days of near Zivus, when there was just so much uh, hope and optimism uh, for for this technology. But uh, in terms of relevance. Uh, of the new OCT near system uh, at ACC uh, in about seven weeks, we're going to see the late breaker of the 1600 patient prevent randomized trial of stenting non-stenotic uh, vulnerable plaques. Uh, what's the relevance of this new system to the prevent trial? So first, <laughs> first I wanna thank Ziad for that wonderful presentation. And, and for the first in human studies, which she helped lead, it was a great contribution. And thank you again, David, for what you did with NEARS when it was in its infancy. <laughs> so uh, the relevance for the PREVENT trial is, uh, is really, you know, someone said it could be transformative uh, because we don't, I don't know what the PREVENT trial is going to show. 1,600 patients, 
randomized to stenting or not stenting for non-stenotic vulnerable plaques detected by NIRS alone, uh, plus IVUS. It was, it was not done with this catheter, uh, which I think is a weakness of the PREVENT trial. There are going to be big yellow spots uh, that are considered vulnerable in that trial that have thick caps. Uh, and you can't tell the cap thickness unless you've got this new catheter. That's one of the uh, very exciting things that Ziad just showed. There's some TICFAs and some thickness, thin-capped and thick-capped yellow spots. Uh, the the PREVENT trial, uh, I, you know, I obviously hope that it's positive, uh, that we can do something about the event rate post-PCI on maximal meds. We, we know that you can't stop I don't think you can stop some of these TICFAs by giving them Repatha and getting their LDL down to 30. I think you've got a structure there uh, that is formed over decades, very complex, and it may well require a stent or a balloon or cryotherapy. So I think uh, you know a lot could change on April 8th, depending on what that study shows. It could open a whole field of trying to treat vulnerable plaque locally. Uh, Tom, this is a very complex, uh, this is a very complex space. But at the end of the day, the industry mantra is simplify and enhance the PCI procedure. This combination of deep OCT and NIRS integrated into a single, almost seemingly plug and play device. Is this technology potentially a great equalizer? I mean, does it have the potential to help the intermediate experience operator who may not have as much experience with advanced high-def imaging improve outcomes in the lab? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's an incredibly exciting technology. I'm, I'm gutted I haven't got the opportunity to get my hands on it in, in the UK. But um, uh, uh, you say leveler, I, I think it might be an elevator in terms of bringing people up. And what we see is a barrier to adoption of imaging. So I think it's important to reflect on where we are and we're embedded in this and in, in truly engaged in the use of imaging in intervention. But the vast majority of our colleagues are not. And the question has to be, well, why not? Uh, and I think the greatest barrier for me is one of confidence and education in terms of interpretation. So anything that provides greater clarity to what we're dealing with, I think is going to engage a new audience to 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 using these modalities to get a better result. I think that's a great point. I will tell you what Nears Ivis did for us. Near the excitement around Nears Ivis, uh, Jim, took started to provoke individuals who were not imagers to start imaging and our imaging. Uh, surrounding PCI went from 11% at our institution to 65% uh, virtually overnight. Um, uh, this this uh, lipid core plaque analysis by NIRS, what's the current utility of detection of lipid core? Is, is that for Ziad or for me? That, no, that's for you. Okay. Um, I think, it, so first of all, I have to confess, I'm not an interventional cardiologist. Uh, up until three years ago. Just a Nobel laureate, but go yeah, ahead. Yes, but that's not science. So it was peace. Doesn't, doesn't really count for this, I've been told. Uh, so, uh, so I treat patients in clinic up until age uh, 77, three years ago. And in that setting, it's very important to, when you get the patient back from after your interventions, what's their risk? And if a person's got a lot of lipid in their coronary arteries, they need intensified medical therapy. I, you know, you fight the uh, payers to get Repatha for the people that have got lipid all over their artery. And you may not need to for somebody that's got uh, red chemo, you know, no lipid in the artery other than the stenosis that you fix. So I think it's got current clinical day, uh, today utility. There are nine studies showing that vulnerable plaques can be detected. All the studies are positive for detecting vulnerable plaque. So you kind of know, and vulnerable patients, so you kind of know who's, who's at high risk, who's at low risk post-PCI. That can help there. I would defer to ZI 
Uh, but I did see a Japanese video where they said, if, if I'm stenting a stenosis and there is nearby lipid, I'm going to put in a longer stent. I paid the stent price. And why not cover that? Uh, so I think that's done. And then there's also a, a, a patient uh, the Japanese have just put on national television who had massive yellow in the left main, no stenosis. And they put that patient, got him down to 30, changed his diet, and then they recast him a yearly for multiple years and showed the yellow decreasing. So I think they stabilized a left main vulnerable plaque. Uh, so I think there, there's a lot of that. But the biggest question, of course, is stenting. Uh, and that's we're going to get an answer one way or the other on April 8th. But this opens up a whole new conversation, Jim, between the interventionalist and his or her partner in the office uh, intensifying medical therapy, right? The, the, the results yeah. of this have implications in the outpatient clinic. Would you agree? Yes, yeah, I'm, I, that's where I often sat, and that's how I treated my patients, uh, you know, but I, I, we didn't have mirrors, so I, I was guessing. So, uh, Tom, uh, this artificial intelligence, this Hyperview artificial intelligence-enabled system looking at lumen, EEL, plaque burden, calcium struts, this is, this is a pretty exciting all-in-one uh, enhanced system. Uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's important probably to separate the two issues of vulnerable plaque, which is a really exciting pursuit, but one that probably for the majority of colleagues is not real time against then this issue around stent optimization. And clearly the AI elements that you've described are what are required to assist in those um, decisions that we, we need to be making on the fly in the cath lab. And anything that will assist us in giving us more accurate assessment of vessel size, lesion length, uh, plaque morphology, I think is is absolutely re required. What's interesting, I think, is that on reflecting on on this paper and on the results of last year, is we work in a fairly binary um, world. It's calcium there, calcium not; lipid there, lipid not. So we have near Ivus, we have OCT with AI capability for calcium. But actually, as Ziad's shown beautifully, we have coexistence of calcium and lipid. <clears throat> and so when we're thinking about a landing zone, everyone at the moment is focused on calcium. But actually, we need, as Jim's beautifully described, you know, the, the lipid there that might mean we extend our stent. Actually, the ambiguity where we sometimes are really challenged in interpreting these images in our daily practice is because we have this coexistence of calcium and lipid. And for the first time, then, it looks like spectral wave is going to offer us an ability to to differentiate between the two or actually show coexistence and so hopefully we'll have then even greater confidence in terms of our decision making that barrier to adoption i think is evidenced by the fact that it's more complicated it's not black and white it's not presence or absence of one or other um and so this is exciting to, to have so the more financial cost the financial cost and the clinical cost for extending a stent five millimeters is is virtually zero, correct? I mean, it it it, it seems to me all upside. Zero. Yeah. All right, yep. Ziad, bring us around third base here. Uh, final words on this. With multiple catheters on the market, when do you reach for this? When do you reach for Spectre Wave? How, how do you integrate this into your practice? There's a lot of competition here for advanced imaging. Yeah, great. <clears throat> and very practical question. I think you've got a very long lesion that you can't image all of it by Abbott. This is a clear winner, right? So you have 10 centimeters and a fast pullback. I think you've got CKD and you can't get a clear flush using the competitive device. This is the go-to if you want OCT imaging. So if you've got a calcified lesion where you can't see by IVAS the thickness of the calcium and has a big clinical implication, Spectral Wave is the way to go. So after your angiogram, you see a long lesion, you see a heavily calcified lesion, you have a patient with CKD, I'm reaching for Spectra. Wow. Last point, Jim, as our Nobel laureate senior advisor. So I would say the cath lab is great. What you, all three of you do is marvelous, but this is the world's leading cause of death. Uh, and it's because, as we all know, there are people walking around with vulnerable plaques who die suddenly. 
uh, non-invasive imaging of vulnerable plaques is improving massively. I think you're going to be sent patients that have a suspected vulnerable plaque on CTA, and they'd like to know in the cath lab, what do they have? And if you find a vulnerable plaque, non-stenotic, what do you do about it? Uh, these are, I think, the new questions that are going to be occupy us uh, in the next several years. Wow. This has been fantastic. I know we're going to have you guys back. Uh, this is not the last conversation we're going to have with this panel. Uh, I am so honored to have represented Jay Sky and Editor-in-Chief Alexander Lansky on this conversation. Again, you can find us online at jsky.org, jsca.org. And again, follow us on X, formerly Twitter, at my. Jay Sky. Jay Sky is the home of all official documents, Sky documents. On behalf of Sky and Jay Sky, my name is David Reisick, and I'm honored to have presented this distinguished panel for this conversation today. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>